My name is Rob English, and in this video, I wanna take you through my entire journey fighting hair loss. From my hair loss diagnosis, feeling torn between a natural or a conventional approach, the six years that I wasted in terms of time, money, and hair on hair loss products that didn't work for me, all the way to making hair loss research my career, to finding a regimen that worked for me, becoming a medical editor, starting Perfect Hair Health, publishing peer-reviewed papers, and working one-on-one -on -one with hundreds of people to achieve hair regrowth and on their terms with or without drugs. Along the way, I'll reveal some of the biggest problems with the hair loss industry, the mistakes that I made that brought me here today, and why I feel it's so critical for you to prioritize education and not product purchases when you first realize you're losing your hair. As you're watching this video, feel free to check out the link below to my free email course on achieving hair regrowth with or without drugs. It's everything that I wish someone had told me 13 years ago when I started this journey. Let's get started. Even as a little kid, I always had fine hair. When I was 10, my mom told me that she wouldn't cut my hair short because it would look too spacey, as if you could actually see through it. And I never really cared because I was young, but then things started to change in high school. I remember this one moment when I was 16 years old. I was in class and I was sitting in front of this girl I liked, and out of nowhere, she poked the back of my head and she said, you have a bald spot. In all honesty, I laughed it off because you know, it's high school and you're not allowed to let people know when they hurt you. But I also felt really insecure and kind of embarrassed. It was the first time that I realized other people also thought about my hair. And the truth was, I'd also felt like recently my hair was getting thinner. I just didn't know what to do about it. So eventually, I booked an appointment with one of the leading hair transplant surgeons and dermatologists in New England, Dr. Robert Leonard. Figured that if anyone could tell me what was going on, it'd be him. After all, maybe this was just all in my head. So I arrived to his office, I met with his consultation officer, and then Dr. Leonard walked into the room. He walked over to me, took a couple combs through my hair, and he said, you've got male pattern hair loss on the crown and the lateral sides of your head, you are definitely losing your hair. I was devastated. At just 17 years old, I was already balding and I couldn't help but ask myself, what am I doing wrong? Why is this happening to me? And can I fix this? Dr. Leonard told me that pattern hair loss is caused by genetics and male hormones. He said that pattern hair loss is chronic and progressive, meaning that without treatment, it would only worsen. And then he laid out my treatment options. One, take finasteride, also known as Propecia, a drug that helps lower DHT. Two, apply minoxidil or Rogaine, a drug that helps improve blood flow. Three, try laser therapy, which at the time was brand new. And four, consider a hair transplant down the line. But what he said next was what really shook me. It was that while all these treatments are scientifically validated to improve hair loss, their success is contingent upon lifelong use. Rogaine is effective only while you use it. Propecia is the same story. And the costs? Back in 2007, a finasteride prescription cost $50 a month. Minoxidil, $30 a month. Low-level laser therapy trial, $2,000 for eight sessions in a clinic, and a hair transplant was anywhere from $8,000 to $15,000. I was a freaking camp counselor. I couldn't afford nearly all of these treatments, but I also didn't wanna lose any more hair, so I felt I had to do something. So I talked Dr. Leonard's team into a trial of low-level laser therapy, and I immediately picked up some Rogaine. I also got a prescription for Propecia or Finasteride, but that night when I went online and read about the drug side effects, I got really scared and I ended up throwing out the bottle the next day. If anything, using Rogaine and doing a mini trial of low-level laser therapy at least eased my mind. I thought to myself, I'm being proactive, I'm reversing the problem. In a few months, things will be back to normal. Well, things didn't go as planned. First, my thinning seemed to slow, but it definitely didn't stop. And after my laser trial ended, all I had left in the fight was Rogaine. After six months and no progress, I figured maybe I was still adjusting to the topical. Maybe I needed a full year to see regrowth? Maybe longer? Fast forward two years later, I'm still using Rogaine and I'm still losing my hair. And that's when I really started to worry. So I did what so many others do in my exact situation. I started searching for natural solutions. Supplements, topicals, shampoos, devices, you name it, I've probably tried it. Biotin, saw palmetto, laser combs, evening primrose oil, emu oil, pumpkin seeds, castor oil, onion juice, apple cider vinegar, copper peptides, turmeric, vitamin A, vitamin E, stinging nettle, beta cetosterol, green tea extract, zinc. I even read stories of people regrowing their hair after trying extreme diets. Vegetarianism, veganism, paleo, low carb paleo, the Ray Peat diet, Gerson therapy. And I started doing all of these things too, each time hoping that what I was actually trying would work, and each time I was met with increasing disappointment. 
Things really started to take a turn for the worse when I went to San Luis Obispo to climb Bishop Peak with my friend and he filmed me on the descent. Watching this video, I don't see the beautiful scenery, the boulders, the landscape. All I see is a bald spot on the back of my head, a spot that was growing each year no matter what I was doing. But around this time, I realized that it was time to evaluate my approach to hair loss. Yes, I was torn between a natural and a conventional approach. I was fearful of finasteride, but I was desperate for regrowth. As a result, I was buying every topical supplement, pill, device, natural that was advertised my way. I didn't realize it at the time, but this is the scenario that marketers love, a combination between bad education and desperation. The fact is, the entire hair loss industry thrives on you not knowing the answers to a few critical questions. First, what's the real risk of side effects for Propecia? Second, do natural products actually work? And if so, which one? Third, are expensive therapies offered by my dermatologists like PRP, lasers, stem cells, and exosomes any better than treatments that cost next to nothing? And fourth, why do some diets and supplements work wonders for some? but not for others. Because if you had the answers to these questions, you would actually be able to fast track yourself to regrowth regimens that fit with your needs and preferences. Not what some marketer is trying to tell you. It took me several years and thousands of dollars to find this out, and I found it out the hard way. But after I did, I made a commitment to myself. Rather than prioritize product purchases, I wanted to spend my time educating myself about the causes, treatments, and complexities of hair loss. At best, I'd find a treatment plan that fit with my needs and preferences, and at worst, I'd find solace in understanding why I'm losing my hair, and in doing so, take back control over a condition that had kind of taken control over me. So that's exactly what I did. I used my university subscription to access medical journals for free and began reading everything I could about hair loss science. JAMA, the British Journal of Dermatology. Dermatologic Therapy, Journal of Investigative Dermatology. And then I started to follow the research of the world's top hair loss investigators. Rodney Sinclair, Ralph Poss, David Whiting, Ralph Trua, and so many others. And what I found absolutely fascinated me. But it also rewrote much of the narrative that doctors, dermatologists, and so many online hair loss forums fed me about the common causes of hair loss and just how much we actually know or don't know about this condition. For instance, did you know that DHT, the hormone that causes scalp hair loss, also causes hair growth in the chest and face? Did you know that genetically identical twins can bald at different rates, meaning that hair loss is not entirely genetic? Did you know that despite the common DHT equals hair loss argument repeated by doctors, researchers still don't quite understand why DHT begins to increase in balding scalps? And did you know that even the strongest DHT reducers can generally stop hair loss, but they very rarely lead to full regrowth. And digging deeper into the research, I also started to realize something else. Yes, DHT is certainly a part of pattern hair loss, but it's also just one of many things implicated in the balding process. A few other big ones that go unnoticed, inflammation, reactive oxygen species, microorganism changes, increased prostaglandins, low blood, oxygen, and nutrient supply to the miniaturizing hair follicles, and even something called fibrosis, or scar tissue. This accounts for the shine that you might see on a slick bald scalp. And where there's scar tissue, hair cannot grow. And fascinatingly, all of these markers also seem interconnected. DHT seemed to trigger some, inflammation seemed to trigger others. In any case, it seemed obvious that the longer these things went on in our scalps, the more scar tissue people would accumulate, and the harder it would be to reverse any of the hair follicle miniaturization already present. So I began to wonder, maybe this was the reason why I wasn't seeing any regrowth. And maybe in these nuances, there could be better treatments for me. I'd soon get the answer. So I began to research ways to improve scar tissue, and soon I found myself diving into the emerging fields of epigenetics, wound healing, and even mechanotransduction, or manipulating skin tissue to change the gene expression as a potential therapy. Around the same time, there was some research buzzing around suggesting a potential way to improve hair. Scalp massages. When I heard about this research, I literally laughed out loud. Scalp massages sounded like the dumbest thing in the world. I'm sure people had tried some version of them for literally the last thousands of years. Where were the results? Needless to say, I was incredibly skeptical. And yet when I dove more into the research, it didn't seem as ridiculous as I once thought. For instance, this study showed that cyclical stretch-based massaging could actually attenuate fibrosis or scar tissue following an injury. These studies on microneedling and platelet-rich plasma therapy showed that acute inflammation a mechanism activated during aggressive massaging could also help remodel tissue and reverse some of the scarring 
even embalming scalps. And this 1985 case study from the University of California detailed the story of a 70-year-old man who regrew most of his bald spot by literally just massaging twice per day for many, many weeks. And later on, studies came out to even support more of this, like stretching-based massages increasing hair thickness by 10% and upregulating proteins associated with the growth stage of the hair follicle. And that hadn't been even out when I was excited about this research. In short, the massages seemed to address a lot of the causes of hair loss that most doctors just glossed over in my appointments with them. So I figured I'd give it a try. Uh, I didn't have anything else to lose. So I built a regimen around all of the literature that I had read and developed specific massage exercises to elicit the stretching, acute inflammation, and the muscle relaxation through pinching, pressing, and stretching therapies. I figured there's nothing to lose, so I might as well commit to these massages for several minutes a day for a very long period, at least a year. Simultaneously, I dropped minoxidil. It wasn't working for me anyway. The results that I saw over the next year astonished me. As a refresher, here's my hair in San Luis Obispo, four years into minoxidil, and I'm still losing ground. Now let's see what my hair looks like one year after doing these massages. This is from 2014, after over a year of massaging. Obviously the lightings and the angles are different, but to me, I could see and feel a huge difference. My hair felt thicker, my vertex looked better, and even my crown's whirl and cowlick had mostly returned. In short, the massages did more for me in one year than minoxidil had done in five years. And I was so happy with the results that I kept massaging to see if I could maintain them. So here is what my hair looked like two years later in 2016. This is a shorter haircut, same location, same angle, but with replaced light bulbs, so things are a lot brighter. We're now three years out from quitting minoxidil, and in my opinion, it's looking just as good as it did in 2014. Again, these are hair changes all through consistent and deliberate massage efforts. So soon after this, I actually started to reduce my massage efforts to just four to five sessions per week. I wanted to know if I could maintain the results with significantly less effort, so I decided to experiment and find out. Let's fast forward three years later, here is how my hair was holding up. This is 2019, same bathroom, same lighting, slightly newer iPhone, so a bit better photo quality, but this is six years after quitting minoxidil and over two years since tapering my massage protocol. Despite way less effort, my hair seems to still be holding and I'm very, very happy about it. After this photo, I decided to up the ante on this experiment and stop massaging altogether. Specifically, I wanted to know how long would it take before my hair thinned back to its 2011 state? Or back to 2012 where people could see a sliver of my balding crown from any single angle. And to my surprise, things have mostly maintained. Just see this video from October of 2020. This is just a few days ago. I'm at the park with my daughter. It's a bright, sunny day, just like in San Luis Obispo. And as I turn to get her attention, check out my crown. Look at the hair density. This is midday, peak sunlight hours, just like San Luis Obispo. Is my vertex perfect? No. But is it way better than it was in 2011? Yes, absolutely. I mean, just take a look and see for yourself. In 2011, I'd pretty much lost the entire whirl of my crown. Today, that whirl is mostly intact, and my hair feels and looks a lot thicker. In fact, after seeing that video, I decided to just film my crown directly and give everybody a close-up view of what's going on. So here it is. Again, this is direct sunlight, midday, very harsh lighting, and while my hair isn't as thick as it was back in 2016, the improvements are still there, even with the tapering protocol, even over a year of doing nothing, and even without the drug interventions. So if you're curious for a more granular look at this progress, we've got dozens and dozens of more photos and videos of me, of my scalp, on the site and inside of our book. They're all timestamped. They all show my hair at different angles, lightings, and haircuts. Again, this video is just my story. It's my perception of progress. But you're free to dig through those other resources and just make up your own mind for where I'm at. In any case, I've been thrilled with how my hair has and still is holding up. And in the future, if my hair takes a nosedive, maybe I'll restart the massages. Or maybe I'll try FDA-approved drugs. 
What's empowering is that the choice is mine and that an intervention outside of the drug model has actually worked for me. And soon I'd find out that it would work for a lot of other people too. In short, I finally saw hair improvements after years of wasted time, money, and energy. And it also happened to be through a therapy that was entirely free. Needless to say, I was thrilled and I wanted to share my success with others so that they could do the same if they chose to outside of the drug model. So in 2014, I started Perfect Hair Health to share my approach, all the supporting evidence, and my hair regrowth with others. After people started downloading the materials, it wasn't long before others started reporting the same success. Take Jared, for example, who saw major hair improvements over the period of a year. I even interviewed him for our site, which you can find a video of. Or JD Moyer, a health researcher who incorporated the massages and has seen major improvements over the last few years. Or Mike, who slowly and steadily filled in his vertex over a three year period with consistent, steady massaging. Or Jenna, who used the massages in conjunction with with metformin to manage your insulin levels and regrow a ton of hair. The list goes on and on. Eventually, we took everything that we learned from the best of the best responders, updated our massage techniques, re-released everything, and then launched a study to determine just how effective these massages were for hair loss sufferers. The results were encouraging, and I ended up publishing them in one of the best open access dermatology journals in the world. After publishing our first two papers, I started to get emails from dermatology journals asking me to review letters, case reports, and other studies that were submitted to their journals. This is a process called peer review, and it's a critical component of research. In short, I became a reviewer for the same dermatology journals that I used to read in college. Next, I started to get some offers from people who wanted help with their own manuscripts, this time as a medical editor. My involvement in the research side of hair loss continued growing. And in 2019, after our massage study received positive feedback, I was actually invited to join the editorial board of Dermatology and Therapy, this time as an editor with a focus on hair loss disorders. It was a huge honor and one that I happily accepted. Today, our website, Perfect Hair Health, has a very small research team dedicated to just publishing papers. We're working on manuscripts ranging from things like diffused unpatterned alopecia all the way to specific scarring alopecias. And we hope to have more papers to share with everybody in the years to come. Suffice it to say, this is now what I do full time and I absolutely love it. Since then, I've published more peer reviewed papers, highlighting the importance of other markers in hair loss and potential ways to address them. I've worked with hundreds of people, produced dozens of success stories, and demonstrated to others that there are ways to improve hair loss outside of the drug model. Which brings me to my biggest point. The hair loss industry thrives on misinformation. The more you're confused, the worse the decisions you'll make about how to treat your hair loss, and the more money you'll waste. So here's some truth that will hopefully make things easier for you. One, finasteride is an amazing drug. Its side effects are overstated online, and if you're comfortable trying it, it's really the best way to go. After all, if I wasn't exposed to so much misinformation about finasteride back in 2007, I probably would have just taken it, seen great results, never went down this research rabbit hole, and I'd probably have a different career right now. So keep that in mind as you're beginning to weigh your pros and cons with natural interventions. Two, most natural products you see advertised are built on bad science. They won't work and you'll just waste your money. I would know, I've tried almost all of them. Three, you can regrow your hair and on your terms, in many cases without any drugs at all. But the right treatment plan depends on your needs and preferences. Your age, your gender, your hair loss type, your hair loss severity, your comfortabilities with drugs, your time availability, and your finances. After all, not everyone wants to commit to massaging, and they shouldn't have to if they don't want to. There are many other ways to see hair regrowth, and that's exactly what we tell people at Perfect Hair Health. We help guide them to the treatments that fit with their needs and preferences. Interventions unique to you, not one-size-fits-all pills or topical solutions. And with that, if you'd like to learn more information, I'd like to invite you to check out our free email course below. This is everything that I wished I had known when I first was diagnosed with pattern hair loss back in 2007. If I'd had this information back then, I wouldn't have wasted years of time, money, and hair, and I would have fast-tracked myself to treatments that actually work that are built on my needs and preferences. So I hope that you've enjoyed this video, and I hope that this small bit of information helps to guide you to treatments that better fit with what you need and your needs and preferences. Thanks for watching. I look forward to seeing you inside the email course, and regardless, I wish you the best of luck with your hair recovery. Thank you.